Hello everyone, Dr. Jake Gordy here, and today I'm going to take you through the final stage of the inflammatory response, which is resolution. We're going to get back to normal. This beautiful image right here is microglia in the brain, which are an innate immune cell that can induce an inflammatory response in the brain. But here we see them back to normal. This is what a normal microglia looks like. It has these long processes that probe the extracellular environment of the brain for um, perturbations, right? So that's what it's doing. And here we can see they're back to that normal, beautiful looking image there. Um, and I actually took this image. I'm very proud of that. It's a good looking image, isn't it? Immunohistochemistry. Alrighty, so let's jump into it. So we're moving from response to resolution right now in the inflammatory sequence. So we've done sensing, signaling, response, and resolution. Resolution. Now, resolution actually involves quite a bit of signaling to cause that resolution, but it's a good way to hit it, think about it. SSRR, sensing, signaling, response, and then resolution. That's where we're up to. Now, there are a few things that need to resolve, and there's actually a few stages to the resolution process. So the first thing we need to resolve is edema, the swelling, the vascular responses. They cannot stay leaky for good. Then we need to resolve the neutrophilic response. It's quite a damaging response. It's the first response, so we need that to resolve. And then lastly, we need the inflammatory macrophage response to resolve. So this is macrophages going in and phagocytosing the debris after the battle has been won. So the neutrophils have won the battle with the pathogen, ideally. And now we need the macrophages to hit in there and, uh, and deal with the carnage of the battle. And then they need to subside too, and we need to end up back to a resting state. So we've got edema resolution, neutrophil resolution, and macrophage resolution. The last thing we then need is tissue restoration and repair. So um, a lot of cells may have died in this process, so we need those parenchymal cells to come back so the tissue can get back to completely normal. So that's the process, that's the sequence of resolution. Now let's jump into that a bit more granularly. So edema resolution, how do we end up with edema resolution? Well, first we need to look at the edema signaling and think how can that edema signaling end right so we have mast cell degranulation going on releasing histamines and that's going to make the vascular porous um, the vascular um, system porous and we're going to get um, vasodilation but also we're going to get cytokine release now one of the major cytokines involved here is that IL-1, which is short for interleukin-1, but that's not very informative. IL-1 is good enough. Everyone knows what IL-1 is. Now, a little known thing about IL-1 is it predominantly can't get out of the cell unless the macrophage dies, right? It's a process called pyroptosis, and it's when the cell fills itself up with cytokines and then it pops, releasing IL-1. Now, what you'll notice about both of those things is they're single shot events. Once the granules have degranulated, you have to make new granules, right? You can't just go, de you can't just continuously degranulate. They take time to build. Same with IL-1. Um, release, it involves the death of the macrophage, right? So that many of the uh, edema signaling molecules are released as single shot events, and they're very slow to reload, right? So we're going to get the release of these signaling molecules, but then they're going to stop. We're not going to end up with another and another wave of these signaling molecules, because they're single shot events that are slow to reload. Now, once they're out, once these, um, once uh, histamine and IL-1 are out in the extracellular space, they're going to degrade, right? So there's enzymes in the plasma and in the extracellular space, even neutrophils releasing their neutrophil elastase. These are enzymes that are going to break down those signaling molecules. And also there's chemical instability and other reactive chemicals out in the environment. So secreted molecules have a limited lifespan and histamine is about two hours and IL-1 is about 2.5 hours in terms of a half-life, right? So the concentration of histamine will drop by half after two hours. IL-1 will drop by half after two and a half hours. So then they'll slowly decay in a concentration. So the single shot events that are slow to reload and the signaling um, the signaling molecules themselves break down over time. And so these natural processes will cause the signaling that causes the vasodilation and the uh, breakdown of tight junctions between endothelial cells to naturally resolve. they have almost got a little uh, a timer on it as it occurs, which is fantastic. So they're self-limiting in that process.
But there is another thing going on as well, and that is anti-inflammatory signaling. So I mentioned resolution has a lot of signaling going on. So we end up with inflammatory signaling, which ends up with anti-inflammatory signaling. And this is a classic negative feedback cycle that's involved in homeostasis. So homeostasis is that uh, biological organisms essentially want to um, maintain a very tight set of parameters going on in their body and any deviation from normality we want to get back to normality and that's called homeostasis and one of the main mechanisms of that is negative feedback so um, something that causes um, a, a deviation will cause the processes that will correct that deviation and will end up back to normal and inflammatory and anti-inflammatory signaling are classic examples of this so um, the interleukin-1 cytokine for example will cause the active of glucocorticoids and the stress pathway. So essentially the pituitary gland releases ACTH, which then, and that's in the base of your brain, and that will cause your adrenal glands to activate. And now these glands that sit on top of your kidneys, and they will release stress store, uh, steroids like cortisol. We've all heard of cortisol as the stress um, steroid, but also glucocorticoids. Um, and these are massively anti-inflammatory signaling molecules in our body. So the, the inflammatory signaling causes the anti-inflammatory signaling of things like glucocorticoids. Now the really powerful steroid anti-inflammatories that we inject in the clinic mimic these glucocorticoid mo molecules. They mimic the stress steroid hormones that are released from your adrenal glands that turn off the immune system. So they bind to receptors all throughout the body to switch off the immune system in particular those vascular responses so that's another way we end back um, with edema resolution they've got they're a single shot event um, the signaling and the signaling triggers a counteracting response an anti-inflammatory response through glucocorticoids and the pituitary adrenal axis and this causes yeah vasoconstriction and immune suppression so that's edema resolution now let's have a look at neutrophil resolution. So um, you'll see a running trend here. Now, again, adhesion molecules are, in some respects, single shot events. So here we have a neutrophil coming along the vasculature. The adhesion molecules have stuck. Now let, look what happens as the neutrophil migrates in. The adhesion molecule is essentially spent, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a single shot event, and now it'll break off and be broken down by enzymes in the plasma or in the liver, perhaps. So um, we can see, again, this is a self-limiting process in the fact that although the endothelial cell could now produce another um, adhesion molecule, once that inflammatory signaling is, has subsided, so the IL-1 and the histamine signaling has subsided, it won't be motivated, it won't have those genes turned on to express those adhesion molecules again. So once they are spent, they are done, which is fantastic. So that is a self-limiting process. Here we have another self-limiting process. So we know the neutrophils degranulate. Again, degranulation is a single shot event, very slow to reload, and we get the production of myeloperoxidase and neutrophil elastase. These are naturally destructive things that destroy the signaling molecules involved in inflammatory signaling. So uh, the myeloproxidase and bleach and the neutrophil elastase actually destroy uh, things like cytokines, which are chopped up by the neutrophil elastase, but prostaglandins also react with bleach. And so we end up with this... Um, neutrophils coming in and saying we need to end everything by sterilizing and destroying everything here and so that helps to turn in a healthy situation that helps to turn off the inflammatory signaling molecules and the damps right so we're going to have damps and pamps floating around so pathogen associated molecular patterns and damage associated molecular patterns if we don't get rid of those pamps and dams we cannot finish and resolve the inflammatory response because they'll go on to activate pattern recognition receptors on other innate immune cells so we need to get rid of the thing that causes the inflammation right the dams and the pamps and these processes the bleach and the neutrophil elastase certainly help to destroy those dams and pamps to prevent that signaling from continuing 
The other thing is neutrophil apoptosis, right? So neutrophils have a natural biological clock. When they come out of the bone marrow, they only last for 24 to 48 hours anyway. They have this natural biological clock. So neutrophils naturally undergo apoptosis, and this is another way that inflammation can resolve. Apoptosis being programmed cell death that you have hopefully already come across in your scientific um, endeavor. One of the hallmarks of apoptosis are these things called apoptotic bodies, and that's the, nu the nucleus budding up into nice little packages that can go on to be phagocytosed by something like a macrophage. So the neutrophil will bleb and bud, and we'll end up with the, seat, the nucleus is breaking itself down right now in a programmed form of cell death. And to make up, to turn itself into nice little packages that can be eaten by macrophages or phagocytosed. Right, so that's the at the end of the neutrophilic response. We've got this natural apoptosis that occurs. And in fact, most of pus is dead neutrophils. They commit suicide through apoptosis, but also through netosis. And so most of pus is um, a neutrophil resolution. It's the death of those neutrophils. Okay, so now onto macrophage resolution, and this kind of uh, anti-inflammatory signaling is critical to turn off macrophages. That's sort of a long-lived, long inflammatory cell that can just be switched on for quite a while. That's why that curve is quite long. And so they need that anti-inflammatory signaling to calm themselves down and switch them into an anti-inflammatory phenotype. Macrophages can actually be anti-inflammatory. We just need to switch them into that anti-inflammatory phenotype. So, um, for example, we get cytokines and prostaglandins released by a macrophage, um, and then that induces glucocorticoids, those stress steroids like cortisol, um, but it also induces anti-inflammatory cytokines. So remember, cytokines are a broad group of protein signaling molecules, and so they can do many, many different things, and one of the things is anti-inflammatory. And it is quite important to know IL-10. IL-10 is one of the most famous anti-inflammatory cytokines of them all. It is the most famous. So whenever we're um, clinically or preclinically looking for an anti-inflammatory response, we often look for that IL-10 cytokine to make sure that there is an anti-inflammatory cascade going on. And another one is resolvins, and this is the great yin to yang, right? So you've got IL-1 being an inflammatory cytokine, that's the yin. The yang, I'm not sure if I've got that around the right way. The yang to that is IL-10. It's an anti-inflammatory cytokine that will turn off things like IL-1 signaling. Now, we've got prostaglandins, which are a fat-derived small molecule inflammatory signaling molecule. Then we have resolvins, which are a fantastically named thing because they're involved in resolving the anti-inflammatory response, and they too are a lipid-derived small molecule that forms this anti-inflammatory uh, response. Now, you might remember the omega-3 craze. That clinically hasn't turned into massive effect sizes, so taking omega-3 supplementation hasn't had massive clinical effects, to be honest. Um, but one of the principles behind it is these omega-3s can be... Uh, are the uh, upstream molecule of resolvents, right? So if you're a massively omega-3 deficient, you may not be able to produce a sufficient amount of those resolvents. Now, clinically, it doesn't seem like it's massively important and omega-3 deficiency isn't that common. And so it's not the limiting factor on resolvent uh, production, but it's just an important note. That may be where some of that hype around omega-3 came from because omega-3 is a fat. Right, so that's a macrophage re re resolution. Now, sometimes this all goes wrong and we end up with chronic inflammation, which is different to acute inflammation. Acute inflammation is often beneficial, um, often, not always, but often, particularly um, in the presence of an infection, it is beneficial, acute inflammation. Whereas chronic inflammation is almost always a bad thing. Um, and uh, chronic inflammation is typically um, a failure of the macrophage resolution, right? So um, macrophages are sort of the master controller of the innate immune cell, and it's their failure, the failure for the macrophage to turn into an anti-inflammatory phenotype and then resolve the uh, immune response that typically results in chronic inflammation. So this is what uh, a failure in macrophage resolution looks like. And there are some examples. So Alzheimer's disease is a form of dementia that's caused by these protein aggregates in the brain. We think, it's still just a theory, but we think the 
primary hypothesis is that these protein aggregates form in the brain and we can see them here they're called amyloid and they're just this uh, insoluble protein aggregate that are surrounded by soluble versions of amyloid that are still oligomeric so there's multiple versions of them all attached together and here we see the microglia which we can think of as macrophages in the brain that's a bit of a shortcut um, and we can see that these microglia as opposed to that first image I've showed you they look incredibly angry and they've surrounded that amyloid Alloy plaque. Here we can see the merge of those two there. Um, and because the proteins can't be broken down by the macrophages and they stay there as this um, aggregate that doesn't go away, we haven't, we cannot get rid of the stimuli that causes the inflammatory response. So we cannot get rid of the molecules that are causing the inflammatory response, these protein aggregates that some people consider damps, damage associated molecular patterns, purely because they're sterile, right? There's no pathogen there. So we cannot get rid of the cause of the inflammation. So we end up with this chronic macrophage inflammatory response. Now these guys will all be releasing signaling molecules. And as I discussed in the previous video, that will cause the odd recruitment of the neutral so the neutrophil, um, even though they can resolve themselves by undergoing apoptosis, for example, um, if they if the signaling that's coming from the macrophage-like cell that is the microglia, if that signaling doesn't go away, neutrophils will keep trickling into the brain and firing off that um, degranulation, neutrophil elastase, and bleach response that they're famous for. So that's Alzheimer's disease. Um, cancer is another example of this. Now, um, can me often cancer tissues are full to the brim with macrophages and they are often chronically activated. Now, there's a number of reasons, but one reason is um, a lack of oxygen, right? So um, if cancer, um, if a cancer growth occurs, so cells divide and divide and divide, and it isn't properly vascularized, so there isn't blood vessels going into that cancer, we end up with a, a hypoxic core, a, a core of that cancer with low oxygen um, and uh, low nutrients, and that causes stress and damage associated molecular patterns, so cellular stress rather than glucocorticoid kind of stress. It causes cellular stress, the hypoxia, which causes the release of damage associated molecular patterns, which causes this macrophage, um, this chronic macrophage inflammatory response. Now, sometimes this can actually be a problem because inf inflammation signaling actually promotes vascular growth for that very reason, right? So the inflammatory signaling by these macrophages might actually help the cancer because it will help blood vessels grow into that tissue. Um, and so that's just a unique way in which um, uh, inflammation can be chronic and contribute to disease. And another one is atherosclerosis. Now this is much, this is um, the blockage of blood vessels through uh, cholesterol crystals, for example. Um, now this is much more like Alzheimer's disease. We cannot get rid of the stimuli. We cannot get rid of these cholesterol crystals. We cannot break them down. So inflammation continues in that blood vessel um, because we cannot get rid of the original stimuli. Similar with cancer, we cannot get rid of that anoxic core, typically that hypoxic core. And so the macrophages continue to be inflamed. Um, and so here we can see a blood vessel and here we can see these cholesterol crystals right there. Here's the cancer and we can see in green we've got these macrophages coming in here. Here's the blood vessel here and in green we have macrophages. So we can see that the macrophage, these large macrophage cells have invaded this blood vessel wall and occluded it. We can see we're losing um, blood flow going through it. A macrophage that eats a whole bunch of crystals and becomes chronically inflamed has a special name called a foam cell, which I love they look foamy because they're so full of these fatty deposits that occur on the inside of these blood vessel walls. Um, and so this can lead to a clot eventually which can cause a number of diseases like a heart attack which is a blockage in a blood vessel or a stroke, ischemic stroke which is another blockage in a blood vessel but this time in the brain instead of the heart. Um, another example of not being able to get rid of that inflammatory uh, stimuli is asbestos, which is uh, a mineral that we incorporate into things like insulation all throughout the 80s and 90s and paint and everything. Um, but what a, it's a very spiky mineral that we cannot break down. So if you breathe that in, we cannot get rid of the inflammatory stimuli. So macrophages um, cannot resolve their inflammatory processes. Now, you might have noticed that um, the immune system is constantly producing reactive oxygen species 
species, particularly those neutrophils, including um, hydrogen peroxide and bleach hypochlorite. Now, reactive oxygen species are famous for damaging DNA, right? And damaging DNA causes mutations and mutations can lead to cancer. So chronic inflammation is often associated with an increase in cancer in that area, right? That is chronically inflamed. And this is one of the ways that asbestos has been linked to lung cancer. We breathe in the asbestos, we cannot get rid of the inflammatory stimuli, the macrophages become activated and inflamed and continually release inflammatory signaling molecules and that never resolves because we cannot get rid of the stimuli um, and so we end up with constant production of reactive oxygen species and we end up with damage to our DNA which can lead to cancer. And we see this with hepatitis which is a viral infection of the liver, they have a much greater risk of cancer in the liver and for example smoking we end up with chronic particulates in our lungs which causes chronic inflammation and cancer um, tuberculosis is another example of this this is a bacteria that can form a resistant spore like uh, formation in your lungs and so we cannot stop the inflammatory response because we cannot get rid of the inflammatory stimuli and the body actually figured out something kind of cool to do there is pack scar tissue around the um uh, the tuberculosis, the, the bacterial infection in our lungs. And if we pack it with scar tissue, we can block immune cells from acting, it, to, acting on it to try and cool the inflammatory response to this bacteria. But another example also is autoimmune diseases. This is when, now this is more of an adaptive immune response, so it'll be covered in other lectures. But um, uh, the autoimmune diseases is when we recognize an a self antigen as a pathogenic antigen. So again, we cannot get rid of that inflammatory stimuli because it's ourselves. Um, and this is just an example, multiple sclerosis. And this is when crudely we think the insulation molecules around neurons um, uh, is, an, is, is a pathogen. We kind of confuse it for a pathogen and we have an autoimmune response to our own white matter, the insulation in our brain, the insulation around those neurons, the electrical ins insulation is how to think of it. It's called myelin. Um, and so this is an, or, an example of an autoimmune disease. We cannot get rid of the stimuli, so we end up with chronic inflammation. Um, now, chronic inflammation is often local, whereas acute inflammation can be local but is often um, systemic. So um, here we have Alzheimer's brains here. These are, um, these are microglia and this is a healthy brain and we can see that they're kind of just acting perfectly normal and they look fantastic. Here we can see this is an Alzheimer's brain. There are protein aggregates and the microglia are having an, an, an acute, uh, sorry, a chronic but local inflammatory response around those protein aggregates there. So um, here we can see um, these little chunks here. This is where these protein aggregates will be. And the microglia have come in and clustered around it and induced a chronic inflammation. But if you actually look out here, here is a perfectly normal microglia right here. And so this is nowhere near the, the inflammatory stimuli. And so it's undergoing a normal uh, life. And so um, often, chronic inflammation is more local, whereas acute inflammation is both local and systemic. So uh, the inflammatory cytokines get up to such a level that our bone marrow start to pump out neutrophils and monocytes into our blood, and we end up with this global response, a pituitary response, an adrenal response. It's happening all over our body um, because it's such an effort to do that massively acute inflammatory response. Um, but typically a chronic uh, a chronic inflammation is much more of a trickle of continuous inflammation at a particular site in our body. Here, here is in green this amyloid plaque and in red we have these microglia surrounding it in a chronic inflammatory state. Um, this is just some research I did which is super cool. Um, so you can actually use a laser to cut out tissue, very tiny, tiny fragments of tissue um, from, say, an Alzheimer's diseased brain, from a dissection from an Alzheimer's diseased brain. And look at what's going on around the plaques that you cut out with a laser versus nowhere near the plaques which you cut out with a laser. So um, here in red is a plaque. I've stained it with a dye that binds to this um, the amyloid plaques. And I've cut it out with a laser. So I've cut out this laser here. And now we can look at the genes that are going on in this cutout. 
So proximal, which means close to the plaque, we can see we've got this IL-1 cytokine expression. So the genes of IL-1 are switched on right beside this plaque. But if we cut out a piece of tissue over here, distal to the plaque, we can see that the IL-1 cytokine levels are very low. And if we look in a healthy individual that has no amyloid plaque, the IL-1 cytokine is very low. So this shows you how local chronic inflammation can be. The local inflammation here is only occurring in 100 microns or a tenth of a millimeter around the amyloid plaque and when we go distal to the amyloid plaque and cut a disc out over here there is no IL-1 signaling going on and this is some research I've done um, which is very very cool I'm very very proud of this using this tiny laser and a microscope to cover oh, it was really cool it feels like proper science that it does so um, here is a table summarize what I was talking about so acute inflammation is fast it's minutes hours days whereas chronic is weeks months and in years. Um, uh, acute is predominantly neutrophils. Remember, pus is dead neutrophils. The uh, chronic inflammatory, the acute inflammatory response is primarily a neutrophilic response, whereas chronic is macrophages and monocytes and lymphocytes. So monocytes are circulating innate immune cells that turn themselves into macrophage-like cells when they go into tissue. Sometimes macrophages are constantly dying. Say they're, be say they're um, phagocytosing asbestos, they might induce an inflammatory response and then die, as particularly if they want to release IL-1. And so then a monocyte has to then come in again, turn into a macrophage to continue this inflammatory response. Um, so monocytes and macrophages and lymphocytes are typically in the category of a chronic infection or an autoimmune disease. Um, so lymphocytes typically aren't involved in those sterile kinds of diseases like asbestos and Alzheimer's disease um, and heart disease, right, atherosclerosis. Um, so um, tissue injury and fibrosis is usually mild and self-limited and acute. When it works, it works great, right? We get, a, we get um, a bit of tissue damage, but then we repair it and it's totally fine. With chronic, because it's over uh, such a long period of time, it can often be severe and progressive and get worse and worse and worse like Alzheimer's disease, um, where it just continues on. Um, so the location, acute is local and a whole body, right? We recruit the whole body to do uh, a, a uh, an acute inflammatory response. One example of that is we get a temperature, right? Um, IL-1 used to be called pyrogen-1, and pyro means fire, um, and because um, IL-1 causes your body temperature to go up. Um, and so that's a that gives you a really good example of how um, acute inflammation is often a whole body response working together to fight this pathogen. Whereas chronic inflammation often goes unnoticed in the whole body, right? Um, for example, if we take uh, a look at the blood of an Alzheimer's patient, it's very close to normal, if not normal. We're constantly looking for a blood biomarker for Alzheimer's disease, and it's very, very tough. We certainly don't see massive amounts of inflammatory cytokines in the blood of Alzheimer's disease. And that's because it's such a local response that the cytokine levels in the periphery never get up above that detectable level. Okay, cool. So in the next video, I'm going to cover tissue repair. So what happens after, um, say we do get macrophage resolution finally, and now we want to repair the tissue, what happens at this stage?